Right, okay, well this, this, is, the, this is the last lecture in, in, in the module, so I think the test is next week. There will be one question related to what I'll cover today. Uh, I'll give you an outline of what's going to be in there. I think there's six questions in the exam and then there'll be one question that has a little bit of malware and a little bit of obfuscation. So the lecture's in two parts. One is it outlines some ransomware uh, work and then uh, we'll go into some basic obfuscation uh, methods. How uh, developers and coders can actually package up executable files and make sure they can't be uh, cracked. So rather than working more at the machine level, we'll work more at the high level and how obfuscators uh, actually work. But before that, what we'll do is we'll look at uh, ransomware. So as you've probably seen, ransomware hits the headlines. Uh, healthcare has been targeted, the finance sector has been targeted. So it is a crime that has a very high success rate. And some would say, is it even a crime? If Can you actually identify a law that defines that someone can't, can't get a piece of software onto your machine and encrypt some files? That, uh, you can read the law in certain ways, that there is, if there's malicious intent, but there isn't any specific law that says that ransomware is, 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 is illegal. And as we'll see, it's generally become crime as a service. Uh, the people who provide it now don't actually need any coding experience. It's all done online uh, and there's a whole affiliate programs and so on. So Trend Micro uh, uh, are, are probably the, the world leaders in, in this area. They know exactly the trends that are happening uh, at any, any given uh, time just now. And they're reporting a massive increase in, 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 ran in ransomware. And it's becoming a, a major problem. So with, uh, as we'll see, CryptoLocker was around, still is around, uh, and uh, law enforcement agencies took down the, 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 the Zeus botnet network in 2014 because that was used to distribute uh, CryptoLocker. So it's quite difficult to strangle uh, the, uh, the distribution network because now they've moved into the Tor network and many of the, the, the services that are provided for, uh, for, for ransomware <coughs> are actually hidden from, from the main uh, network. So there's some serious criminal gangs out there that are using ransomware uh, for, for their, their malicious purposes. So I'll give you a bit of background behind ransomware. So we do quite a bit of research here we get many companies approaching us. Unfortunately, it tends to be the small companies. <laughs> the big companies like the banks have got all the mechanisms defined. They, they create shadow copies. They forever back up. If they find ransomware, they instantly recover the instance. It's the small companies. It's the one or two person companies that get hit the most. Uh, there was a com hairdressers in Glasgow that, that was hit. Uh, a lot of the accounts and so on and the customer details w were, were encrypted and there's very little a company like that can actually do uh, because they, they need to pay the ransom to get the, the files back and then unfortunately when they got the files back they found out that many of the some of the files were corrupted so there are bugs in, in, the, in, the, in the software so it's not always the case that when the, the ransom is paid then everything is okay when, when, it, when it's recovered. So this was some research that Trend Micro did. Uh, it took you up to about the middle of 2016. But you can see the number of families really took off in 2016. Uh, typically, the, we started to see the code appearing on GitHubs. It was, it was easily available, uh, and then it was modified for uh, other, other purposes. So the general rise, and we've seen that throughout 2016, uh, as, as we'll see in, in a little minute. And then when, when they did some research uh, just uh, in the middle of last year, uh, 
half of half of the companies got their their data back uh, and and paid. Twenty percent said that they paid but didn't get their their data back, and only thirty five percent said they didn't pay uh, the ransom. If you have your the MSC thesis, it's been encrypted on your disk and you haven't backed it up to Dropbox or into the cloud, there's very little you can do. If you're very lucky, uh, law enforcement will have the encryption keys uh, available uh, if, if they've been discovered. But if you're, if you're not, then there's very little that you can actually do about it but actually pay the ransom. So you can see that as a, as a crime has a very high success uh, rate and probably one of the highest success rates of all, all criminal uh, activity in, in cyberspace. We can actually see the evolution <laughs> of ransomware and you can see more and more we're seeing new families uh, being, being, being created. So it kind of go <laughs> goes back uh, to this one here, the GP, the GP uh, uh, coder one. We have the Privetun priv here. Uh, and then generally we've evolved through the integration of things like Tor, uh, Tor networks. So here's, here's some of the, the history. And it shows you the basic evolution of how ransomware has, 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 has happened. So the Revitun was 2012, and you've probably seen <laughs> That message. Have you ever went to a website and there's a there's a there's a, a graphic that says you've went to a bad place and uh, we're reporting you to to the Met Police. Uh, please now uh, pay uh, one Bitcoin from this account. I, I don't expect you to own up to that, but you have seen that 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 type of message. Unfortunately, there was a there was a teenager in the UK who committed suicide, he couldn't tell that this was a fake message and he was really worried that his parents would find out and he committed suicide. So it's not a, a, a victimless crime. Uh, the money is, is paid, but it can also lead to uh, things like uh, doxing, uh, where uh, a, a cyber criminal using ransomware can steal images of a person and then can bribe the person to say that they will release images on, onto the internet. When it's things like company sensitive documents, uh, then it's probably the fault of the company who have allowed the ransomware to grab sensitive documents and so on. But when it's individuals, uh, then it's really not an, a, a, nice, a nice crime uh, at all. So then it went on to, to CryptoLocker 2013. It was the first one to integrate cryptography into it and also to have a downloadable components from, from, uh, uh, from, from a, a web infrastructure. We then seen Crypto Defense, which start, was the first one to use uh, public key encryption. So I'll explain the encryption involved, but the core of most of it is public key encryption. So it was using top quality uh, uh, RSA encryption to, to make sure that the, that the keys were, were, were protected. It also used native APIs uh, for the first time. It was using the APIs on the machine to create it. Rather than downloading its own crypto, it was using the native APIs within typically Windows. We're, we're still about 80% uh, in terms of Windows. Mac, Linux are increasing fast, Android. Uh, the iPhone and the iPad, not quite as much because you know why, why the, the iPad and an iPhone are, are less vulnerable to, to, to malware? So the app chains? The, the app chains, every, every application is running in, inside a container? Uh, uh, a bit of both. <laughs> every every app's got to be signed by a certificate. Apple only allow certain people to have certificates. We as a university, if you're interested, we have certificates that we can sign uh, the the apps. 
but the apps do go through very strict uh, testing by Apple. Google, <laughs> not so much on life, and there are, there are open source uh, stores for Google. Uh, we did some research last year and we found quite a lot of malware. There was one piece of malware for Android that had 140 <laughs> pieces of detectable malware on VirusTotal. It wasn't definite that they were all malware, just because VirusTotal says that something looks like a malware isn't, isn't the case. But there was one that we found, I won't say where it came from, but it was an Android that, that was just full of back, back doors. Uh, so the, I, the, I, the iPhone and iPad tend to be much more uh, locked down, but there are, there are cases of actually properly signed uh, ransomware for, for iPhone and uh, iPad. So we got that uh, simple, it was only a matter of time before Android was targeted. Uh, so simple locker, uh, basically you, you started up your phone and it basically said you need to provide a PIN number to be able to get access to your phone uh, or, or pay the, this, this, this ransom. But it's generally, generally focused on Windows most of the time. CB Locker used a command and control infrastructure. So a botnet has command and control. You, get, you drop the malware onto the machine, it then contacts the command and control and downloads the whole of the rest of all the components that it actually needs. It will use HTTPS or Tor or something to actually hide that. But once it's on your machine, that's it. All that the intruder wants is a little download, small download, to create a little backdoor. Once the backdoor is there, then everything will happen in, in, in secret. It also deleted the shadow file. So I don't know if you know about it, but if you run Windows, every file is shadowed. So if you delete something or you do something wrong, there's actually a shadow copy kept in, in Windows. It's really a smart way if you do something wrong, you can actually recover your shadow version. So CB Locker actually disabled that, that service. <laughs> okay, so if you're running a corporate environment, make sure that your shadow the shadow files are enabled uh, all the time and that you've got some sort of backup. Crypto Wall made $325 million. That's pretty serious business for a bit of code. Uh, and it became really a, a, an industry, a crime as a service in itself. It created a registry key so that it was able to sustain itself on, on the machine. It put itself in the startup, as we've seen malware wants to do that. It wants to keep living, uh, and then it was it was able to, to to persist. The Crimea was an unfortunate one. It was a doxing ransomware, and it threatens to publish stuff online. If you don't pay the ransom, then we're going to we're going to publish all your pictures and all your documents and all your emails and and so on online. So a really unfortunate uh, type of uh, thing. Uh, Tesla Crypt had another persistence. Seven was 13 bitcoins. Do you know how much a bitcoin is worth these days? I wish I'd bought ones last year. <laughs> I think they're double, they've doubled in value in, in a year. How uh, <laughs> much? One bitcoin. They link it to the dollar, which, which I, don't know, I don't know if that's it's a valid thing. I think it's about $1,000 for a, for a bitcoin, is that? Uh, might be wrong there, but a thousand or so on. So that's that's a lot of lot of money uh, to pay, and basically they said, right, that's it. <laughs> we'll delete your whole disk if you don't if you don't pay. Uh, K Ranger was the first Mac OS malware, and it used a proper signed certificate for 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 the Mac. Uh, Jigsaw, if you've ever seen it, uses the characters from Saw. Uh, as the message, I and mean, if you really want to be scared, then the, probably the pictures of the saw characters are about as scary as it's as it's as it's going to get. It deletes files every hour, and it deletes a thousand files on on reboot. So it's a pretty serious thing. If you don't pay quickly, then it's just going to keep trashing your your, your files, and you'll lose them, uh, and so on. Random. Uh, we'll come back on to. <laughs> I hate to scare you, but it's a JavaScript. So it basically jumped out of, of uh, a sandbox, 
and it could run on any machine. So Random32 uh, uses uh, NWJS, the kind of Node.js, the new way of doing computing. The old way is EXEs and stuff like that. The new way is much more built around web and Node.js and distributed computing and running with inside uh, web, web infrastructures. So this one here, we'll come back onto it and explain how it, how it works. We did quite a bit of analysis on Random32. Uh, picture overwrites your master boot record, pretty scary. That's what viruses used to do in the past, but that gets it right into the boot level, uh, encrypts and doubles the ransom every seven days. <laughs> so that's another motivation for the victim to pay quickly, because if they don't, then more and more files will get encrypted uh, on, on the disk. Uh, Locky, Locky was healthcare as a ransom. So the hospitals in California and Kentucky <laughs> were targeted. If you, want, if, if you really want to be nasty as a cyber criminal, and healthcare is probably one of the, uh, the worst areas to, 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 to target when you think about it. You're, you're, you're encrypting patient records and, and so on. And there's very little, if there isn't backups, uh, which can happen in small medical practices, then the victim is likely to pay that, that, that ransom. So healthcare in the public sector in the UK, I think there was, an, there, was a, there was a case in Scotland, it wasn't a big one, but it took them three, three days or so uh, to, to, to clean it and, 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 and get rid of it. Uh, so you can see a large scale outage in, in the public sector would cause a lot of problems. Uh, <coughs> so that was Lockie. We'll come back on to Lockie. Then there was Samsam, which targeted uh, uh, web servers rather than hosts. It went after uh, web servers. And, and, and they're, they now have uh, full voice communications and video. You can actually speak to the victim. Uh, and they have a communication through the Tor network. They enable text to speech. So you can actually speak. You, your machine has now been locked. You now need to pay. Uh, this is a helpline. <laughs> we'll help you through uh, the uh, cleaning your, your machine. And it just seems there's a whole support. There's online support, 24-7 online support. And they have friendly operators on the other end of the line there to help you. That's oh, okay, we'll, we'll help you. Don't worry about it. Your files will be fine. We'll talk you through it. It's really bad that this has happened, but don't worry. It's okay. Just pay that the Bitcoin and you're fine. That's okay. We'll, we'll, just, uh, we'll just, just get, get you there. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if, you've, if you get these calls. I get them all the time at home and I tend to sort of keep talking. To, 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 to people who, who, will, who will vish, vish you. And it's really getting quite scary now. You've now got Powerware coming along. Powerware is using the PowerShell. PowerShell, if you've ever used it, we use PowerShell for our cloud. It gets right into the native level of the machine and can get uh, PowerShell to do all the kind of nasty stuff, like find files and delete them and encrypt them and, and, and so on. And then there's now Zcrypt, Crypto, which is a, a worm. So worms are back, and worms spread over a network looking for places to, to infect. So that's quite scary because once the, the worm is behind a firewall, it can spread across the, the whole network. Okay, so that's where we are. And you can really see that 2016 was a big, a big time for ransomware uh, and increased greatly. And now you just can't get rid of it because it's on GitHub. So you'll find there are Git, GitHub repositories for the, for the code. Uh, people can fork the code as required. And you'll find a lot of the malware is based on previous code. They'll maybe have a bug in one or they're using a weak method in one. By the next version, somebody's fixed that and it's actually been, be, been, been improved uh, from, from there. So it's, it's very difficult to, to, to get rid of it in there. So what's the main methods that, that ransomware uh, uses? So uh, the more traditional one is the locker. 
the locker just locks your machine so that you can't get into it at all. Uh, a good thing with that is that you could probably go to system recovery, you could probably take your hard disk out and you can probably get remote access to the machine. So it tends not to be a major problem and all they've done is that when, the th when your machine boots up, say into Windows, they've put in some sort of pause page that will stop you from getting into the, into the, uh, the main machine. Typically they're putting it into the app data folder uh, and they're running a little file that just comes up and actually if you control alt delete and, and stop a task uh, then you can use the get rid of it. So it's not a, a big worry uh, but there are some that, that, that do some serious ones, especially ones that lock your master boot record such as this one. The crypto ransomware one it requires a, an encryption key to, 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 op, uh, to release your, your files and that's the most typical one that we see these days. Master boot record uh, writes into the, the boot of the machine so it's difficult to get rid of it. And increasingly we're seeing web server encrypting ransomware which goes after a certain, uh, typically exploits a certain vulnerability in a web service, web infrastructure and it will go ahead and encrypt files on, on the web service. And that's quite a scary one for many companies because it can be difficult to, uh, to, get, to uh, get, get round that if things like databases are, are encrypted. And then there's an increase in mobile device uh, ran ransomware. Okay, so this is, this is the early stuff was around that kind of thing when you went to kind of dodgy sites <laughs> That's the kind of message that, that you get. You'll typically see a picture of the Queen. You'll see handcuffs. You'll see someone from the Met Police and they'll be pointing a finger at you. Uh, there's ones I've seen that are just overload completely about law enforcement. You've done something bad uh, and so on. And you wouldn't believe the number of people who, who fall for this one, who think that they've done something bad, especially kids who can't tell, autistic uh, kids uh, that, that can't understand that, that what they're seeing isn't actually the, the truth uh, and, 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 will, and will pay instantly. Uh, so the places are typically uh, with Bitcoin, with Ucash uh, and, and, and so on. These are the typical uh, uh, ransomware uh, payments that, that, uh, that Trend Micro Scene. You can see that mainly they're, they're, under, they're under a thousand, but we know of some examples of serious uh, payments uh, made by large corporate infrastructures that uh, organizations that, that have went ahead. So you can actually see they're moving up there, uh, and there, I think there has been cases of well over 100k ransomware in, in large uh, organizations but companies don't want you to hear about <coughs> them. It's quite embarrassing for a company uh, to actually pay a ransom and for it, for it to be known that that company uh, was, was, was it, uh, affected. Okay, so I'll give, you a, I'll give you an overview of how ransomware works and then we'll go into a bit more detail. But this is basically uh, what goes on. Uh, there's the, the, we'll call them a criminal. <laughs> Uh, they are. So they're, they're, the, they're the person who gets the, who gets the money, who has the motivation, who decides to do this, uh, this. There's then their service provider, the service provider, <laughs> their crime service provider. It's a, it's a weird concept, but you now have a service provider who will now go ahead and create your campaign, gather your money, uh, monitor all the machines that have been infected, and so on. They become your service provider. That's your main portal. There's no coding involved for for the criminal. It's all done as a service. Uh, the it's an affiliate program. If if you recommend someone, you'll get five percent. Uh, the service provider will take twenty percent of any of your uh, the gains. So there's money in it for them. And then the distributor is Tor or some peer-to-peer network that allows the malware to, to actually spread. So typically what happens is that the distributor 
such as a phishing email, uh, we'll say, please click on this. This is the HMRC uh, uh, document to pay your tax. Uh, they'll typically do it at certain times of the year to make sure that you're probably hitting the time the HMRC comes out. Or it'll be a Mother's Day card or Father's Day card or something like that. Please click on that. And the document itself, typically EXE doc VBS uh, screen capture, uh, once the user clicks on that, then it drops the, the back door uh, onto the machine. Then what happens is, is typically the components are brought in from a, from a, a command and control infrastructure if it needs them. Increasingly it doesn't in that the, the malware itself is all packaged and it can do everything offline. So the, the new ones are coming out that it doesn't need to contact the command and control and, it, and the device can go offline straight away and, and, and it still works. So what it typically does is that it will generate a unique AES key and then it will, it will hunt for certain files on the machine. Uh, doc, Python, uh, source code is a great focus for them because they know if, if they encrypt some source code, then the company or the organization is, is, in, is in trouble. So it goes and searches and encrypts them. Then what it does is it takes the public key of the ransomware provider and it encrypts the session key with uh, the, the, the provider's public key. So can you explain to me what happens next? How, how, is the, how, is the, how does the, uh, the criminal or the, or the, the system now able to get the encryption key back to the user? or the target. So we've taken the public key of the crime gang and we've encrypted the session key of the encryption. Tell me what happens next in terms... So that gets sent back. What needs to happen next? So we use the public key of the crime gang to encrypt the session key. So what, 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 what needs to happen next in order to, to get the files recovered? You have to decrypt them with their private key. Sorry, say again? You will have to decrypt them with their private key. Yeah, so that gets sent back uh, and then the private key is then used to decrypt and then the crime gang now has the key that's been used to, to, to decrypt uh, the files. <coughs> so once so that, that gets sent, we then use the private key of the ransomware provider uh, to unencrypt. Uh, they are then shown a message to say they should pay. So those are typical payment uh, methods. Once they pay, then they'll receive uh, a, an email uh, actually with their with, with the key that was, that was actually used and to be able to release the, uh, uh, the files. So the typical approach is to drop the executable, as we'll see a little bit later, into app data and the local data folder. Uh, they then modify the registry keys, they search for certain files on, on the machine, they encrypt, delete the volume, shadow, copies, and then display the, the ransom note. Okay, so that's the way that it, that it typically uh, works. So early ransomware looked a bit like that. Uh, and uh, so this is GB, GB code. And uh, it basically said that your, your files are being encrypted uh, and that you had to uh, release them. And then we had uh, toolkits that allowed you to be able to uh, uh, create pages where uh, it looks like you've done something bad. This one here actually has a, has a live video link so that they can actually speak uh, to the person uh, directly and, and talk them through what they've, they've actually done and then uh, obviously pay, pay the money uh, from, from there. 
So this was fairly popular about 2013, 14. And there was even sort of toolkits that allows you to, to customize the language. So the web page that it went to uh, would detect the country that you were in uh, and then it would customize the, the message, uh, even with the different police, <laughs> police forces in the different countries. So in the UK, you'll see the Met Police and, and the Queen and so on, where in other places it, it, was, it was tend to be focused on, <coughs> on, on the, the, the law enforcement within inside that, that area. So CryptoLocker was probably the first big serious uh, uh, ransomware. Uh, CryptoWall, CBLocker, Tesla, Crypt, CryptoFortress were all based on, on, on Crypto crypto locker. So it's a bit difficult to see from that graphic there, but it was just what I explained earlier on, that basically we have a key pair, public key, private key. Uh, we send the public key with the ransomware. It creates a session key with AES encryption. Uh, then uh, we send that back and the private key on the command and control will then decrypt the session key and give the session key back to the to the user to be able to decrypt their their, their files, but this was a typical uh, message here that that, uh, that that was received uh, when when somebody was infected by by CryptoLocker, and then CryptoWall came along. CryptoWall got a lot more serious, and that it w it gave you a, a complete end to end. Uh, solution. So this was starting to look at ransomware as a service, crime as a service, where we had exploit kits and phishing emails, infrastructures, uh, some way to distribute uh, the, the, the malware, and then there was some way to actually gather the, uh, uh, the results back again. And it really created an end-to-end -end solution for, for cyber criminals to be looking at the latest exploits that, that were there and then using phishing emails to get them out uh, and then sustaining it through to, the, to, a, to a payments uh, network. So it really took off with uh, talks in Random32 where we started to look at ransomware a, as a service. So it was McAfee were the ones, so McAfee became Intel Security and I think they're back to McAfee again. So they found on the dark web uh, this, this site, Tox, and uh, it allowed people to be able to create the, the malware required, uh, but didn't actually need to have any coding skills. So it wasn't even that you got an exploit kit and you modified that, as we've seen in the last lecture. In this way, it was purely done as a, as, as a service. Everything was there, the support was there, and so on. Uh, Tor, Tor was used. Uh, it's goes to an onion site, so you, you won't find this website by searching uh, the internet as it is. You've got to go to the dark web and actually discover it from there. So it's a dot onion site. You need a Tor browser. It links exactly into Tor. It doesn't come back out of Tor onto the main network internet it stays in the Tor network. So it's impossible for someone to be able to listen or even understand any of the communications that, that goes on. Uh, so 20% were taken as profit. 20% was taken for creating the, the service. The registration was free uh, and it created an executable that, that uh, could be used uh, to, to target systems. <coughs> so this is, uh, it's difficult to see here, but this is the Random32 console. Uh, you'll be able to see better on, on the slides, but it, th this is a little console that says the number of installs, uh, the number of people who have paid, the number of bitcoins that you've received, uh, the number of, uh, of machines locked. <laughs> So every day somebody could log into this and actually find out how many bitcoins that they've received as this crime as, as, as a service. Uh, and it's in this console here 
that the that whoever controls it can actually uh, see what what's been uh, installed. And random thirty two is completely written in, in JavaScript, which means that it can run on virtually every every machine. And it uses the nw.js uh, infrastructure for JavaScript. Many companies are moving towards that in terms of their their web infrastructure, uh, and allows JavaScript to 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 be able to to create the main processing that, that you actually actually need. And, and it allowed you, the malware to jump out of the sandbox that normally exists in a browser and run things directly onto the machine. Rather than having a backdoor or some piece of code, cross-site scripting that drops through uh, the, the web browser onto the machine, uh, Random32 allows the JavaScript to actually run things actually on, on the machine. And so it creates this 128-bit uh, encryption key for it there. Okay, so this is the this is the JavaScript that uses. Uh, does anybody use this this one at all? Certainly, uh, many companies are moving towards Node.js and uh, this WNW.js, uh, but it takes the code out of the sandbox and actually runs it uh, directly on, on, on the machine. And it really doesn't matter which operating system it's running on. This will, Random32 infects Mac OS as, as much as it, as it does uh, uh, Windows. Uh, so we did an analysis here. So this was the, this was, yeah. Uh, you, you, you enable it and there's very little you can do. I mean, JavaScript is now the de facto in, in most web development systems. Most We're moving towards client-based processing. So the whole idea of us moving towards server-based was we thought PHP and ASP and, and so on would be the way forward and we'd have a lightweight client. But then people say, this is crazy. <laughs> I have a quad core machine here, it has lots of memory. Why don't I load the whole program onto here and, and run it in, in a browser and in a client? So JavaScript is it's horrible, but it's 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 the de facto code now. It's almost native. <laughs> yeah, so, that, so it really is I mean, as with you know, a year or two ago, the only thing to do with Flash was just to block it. Now the only thing to do with JavaScript is to block it. But I think it's impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, everything that you do now on websites is JavaScript uh, on to Block all JavaScript by default. You start toggling what you want to execute about. Yeah, and what? Sorry, what was the last bit you said there? You selectively enable it for specific websites. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to lock down, so you yeah. you, you create a whitelist. Mm -hmm. So the way forward for mo for this type of thing is not a blacklist. <laughs> But a whitelist, a whitelist will lock you down, and I think you do certificate pinning, and so on. So you've got to make sure that whoever connect, connects to your web server is has been identified properly. So you see that some sites now, if you if you don't have a certificate, or you don't see the certificate, then then you won't be able to, to connect to it. So so JavaScript has kind of ruined the world uh, just now, and it's going to be more, and it's all about pushing the processing to, to, the, to the client and less is done on the, uh, on the server and now. And in a few years you'll actually find that most apps will be running actually on the, the, the client in a browser and typically using uh, uh, JavaScript. So this, this was the one we investigated here. So this is random32 uh, rar. I did have this but I can't find it <laughs> in, in, anymore. Uh, I, I'll search for it for you. But th this is what you get when, when you select all your options <laughs> uh, from, from there. And I know it's a bit difficult to see, but you've got Chrome.exe, Chrome 
which is the packaged up NW uh, dot JavaScript. Uh, and there's a few other little things in there. VBS scripts are particularly are, are particularly evil because they run Visual Basic scripting. They're right on your operating system uh, from there. So this is this is what we identified. So there's a there's a U dot VBS here. Uh, that deletes. That, that's the little script that deletes all the files uh, on in a, in a certain folder. Uh, we found the chrome.exe uh, here uh, containing a fully packaged NWJS application, the whole framework. It brings that, that in there. And then there's a little program called G uh, and, and it creates the, the information that's, that's required to be able to make uh, the, the ransomware run. <coughs> so as what we found is that uh, these were the files that it targeted. The ransomware doesn't want to go after <laughs> your executables. It, and it definitely doesn't want to go after the Windows, 30, the Windows folder or System32. It avoids those places like the plague unless it wants not to boot up your computer. <laughs> Uh, so it will avoid all your executables and and stopping you from booting it. It will go after all your images, all your Java files, uh, your Python files, uh, your spreadsheets, PowerPoints, and so on. So those are the ones, and you'll see it searching your disk, going into folders, looking for Python scripts and, and so on. <coughs> and then it will go and then in, in, encrypt these. We found that it avoided these, these folders uh, because really if they touch them, then that would corrupt your machine and you wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> Not you store all your important stuff, just put it all in, in Windows. <laughs> you could do that, yeah. If you're, if, you're, if you're that paranoid, then stick everything in Windows 32, you'll be okay. <laughs> no, that, that would be good. Stick it on the desktop. No, that, that's not a good idea, is it? Uh, Okay, so th those <coughs> random 32 uh, looks for those ones and, you, and it's going after the, the Java stuff and all that. And when we looked at the, the VBS script, so I don't know if you can read VBS there, but basically that's, that, that's you, you give it a directory and it goes in and, and, and erases <laughs> that whole directory. It'll typically take these files, encrypt them, take a copy, <coughs> And then it goes in and runs that script, and then your 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 files are now gone. So they'll have some strange file extension that you've probably never seen before. They certainly won't be associated with anything. You're kind of stuffed. Uh, the file extension could vary. You can't tell from the file extension what your original file is. Most of the modern ransomwares will get rid of your original files. So it looks really bad. You've lost all your files. What should be there? is gone and then it's replaced by these big long good uh, values like 564 goes on uh, and it's just like a random random number. Hopefully whoever's written it knows how to get your original file name back and the file obviously but you can't be guaranteed that that's actually going to happen. So that was the random 32 and uh, uh, people are really scared of, of that one. And Random32, the original ransomware we analysed used electronic codebook. Uh, what's electronic codebook? As you can remember from your other module. <laughs> I know it was a while ago. It doesn't use an answer. It doesn't use an answer. It doesn't use an initialization vector, no salt. Uh, so <laughs> So you actually see repeated patterns. Uh, I'll show you one in a little minute. Uh, so that's how novice some of the early malware, the ransomware was. They were using uh, ECB, which is <laughs> pretty rubbish. And then somebody found out that you could actually crack that quite easily. And then they changed it to CBC. Uh, but the Random32 uses uh, AES-CRT. I appreciate we haven't covered that at all. But CRT is, is used to create a cipher stream. A cipher stream is one bit at a time. 
is the encrypted rather than waiting for blocks it uh, encrypts it. <coughs> I don't know why they've used this method. It's quite good in terms of kind of error detection and, and things like that. Uh, but that that's what that's what they're they're using uh, in in their 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 main method there. Okay, so let's look at, at specific examples uh, from that. So so we run our uh, we run our ransomware in Cuckoo. <laughs> okay. Do not do not run ransomware in an an uh, an environment, even on the cloud, in a VM. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, even as a VM, you can still have a network connection. Run it in Cuckoo. So we have Cuckoo running, uh, and uh, we plug it in. Uh, we have a hard disk that we plug in uh, with USB, and it's running. Cuckoo, and we can analyze the the, the samples fr from there. Uh, ransomware is particularly bad for if you don't make sure that everything is set up correctly, you can end up doing some bad things onto your machine or onto other other people's machines. So Lockheed was found 2016, and it was uh, it targeted healthcare. <laughs> So if you've seen a lot of the US, uh, many US healthcare organizations were targeted by, by Lockheed and it, and it went in, I think there's been quite a few examples in the UK, but it was typically focused uh, in California and so on. It went after, after healthcare, CT scans, emergency rooms, pharmacy operations, real bad areas uh, for, uh, for, for attack. It used Tor and Bitcoin for payments, and it was using 128-bit AES, 2048-bit RSA for encrypting uh, of it uh, from, from there. And it would take over 160 different file types and uh, encrypt them. So this is the message that you typically get. Uh, you'd get a doc file, uh, and click on the doc file, and it will install the back door into the machine, then goes ahead and 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 you see an infected message such as 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 this. Okay, so hopefully I can get this to to run. So this is uh this is locky. It's gonna run. Oh so let's see if we get the video to run here. Oh. From there, just let's see. That's embedded itself. Uh, well, I'll give you a, a demonstration after the break uh, from that. And then Cerber, Cerber uh, came around, and uh, it's quite strange that it has a blacklist of of countries not to target. <laughs> and I won't say what, where those countries are, but there are, there's a list of ones that that Cerber shouldn't run. Uh, in as an affiliate program that people can sign up sign up to uh, for that uh, it does everything offline so there's no need to everything is packaged there's no need to, to contact the command and control uh, infrastructure so once you've got it then that's it uh, the files are encrypted and you've got to, you've got to then contact the, uh, the, the the person who sourced it it does a uh, UDP now so there's no TCP and I'll show you a little trace in it after the break, but it has a list of IP addresses that it just goes out and, and tries them, and it will send uh, a UDP uh, request. It also has a speech, <laughs> speech uh, uh, macros uh, built into it, so that the intruder can actually speak to the person who's been infected, and it can actually tell them what to do and how to pay, uh, and so on. And the one thing it does try to do is it tries to, to disable your UAC uh, from there. So this is the message that, 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 that you get uh, from it. And I'll show you an evidence bag here. So this is a, this is a, a real evidence bag from uh, Cerber that we, that we ran in Cuckoo. <laughs> so there is a, there isn't. Uh, so just let me try and find where my evidence bag is. Let's go here. Uh, I think I've put it into results. Three, yeah. 
Oops, seems to think it's an Arduino. Right, okay, so let's have a look at, uh, at this. Uh, so what Cuckoo gives you is that it, it communicates with, uh, it, it communicates with Virus Total and, and, and checks the files that it, that it receives, but it gives you a full trace of what actually went on so all your evidence bag is, is, is there, but what we'll do is we'll look at the summary sheet. And while it's doing that, and let's have a look at the dump. And we should be able to see the Wireshark trace of the, of the virus. And if we really want to see what went on, there's the screenshots. Uh, of the machine being infected, uh, so you see uh, w what what you see. I, I do have a YouTube video for this. What you see in each of these is that you can actually see uh, files being selected on the desktop, and then 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 encrypted, and then eventually what you'll see is the machine <coughs> being encrypted, such as from that one there. So between here. And here, you, you're seeing your machine actually uh, being encrypted. So that's the message that you get. They tell you to go to an onion. There's three onion tour addresses that you must now go, go to, to to pay, to pay the, the ransom. But as I said, it has a voice <laughs> stuff in it now. So it will speak to you. Uh, I haven't recorded one yet, but it will say hello. <laughs> And it'll give you a, a French voice, or uh, it uses the standard Microsoft voices, and it will actually speak to you in in the language of of, of your of your machine. You see, it going in and searching for the language uh, that that you're using, and it will it will create the voice for that. Okay, so that so our evidence bag uh, is here. Okay, so this is what Cuckoo. Cuckoo gives you. So it's difficult to see from there, but it's going to give you all the files, signatures, screenshots, a static analysis, any files that's dropped, the network trace here. Uh, it's difficult to see that. Any behavior and any vol volatility. Okay, so we can see here it's a Windows 7 machine that's that's been infected. Uh, there's, there's the screenshots uh, from our our device from there and you can see it it will then show you which files were dropped onto the machine and this one here is the core malware it's been given a random ID so what's happened is the person has run the has opened the, the doc file it then downloads this file and then all these associated ones are coming in as all the components that it actually needs to be able to run the code. So this is the command and control center sending the, the files uh, uh, to it. Uh, if we then look a bit further, we should then see all the files that the malware, the ransomware, has actually uh, read. So here, we can see the malware reading through all the targeted files. So there's a Python file, there's a PPT, HTML, doc, uh, and so on. So this is the, the ransomware going through the machine and reading e each file, and then it'll go and encrypt uh, th those, those files. So we can tell straight away which machines have been, which files have been uh, are targeted. Uh, the trace also tells us all the IP addresses that have been involved in it. Sometimes there's ones to do with uh, Windows updates and Google updates and so on, but in here you will find the, the command and control host that has been uh, ad identified. So we've got DNS requests. We will look at all the DNS. Typically the IP address these days is more likely to be hardwired, 
uh, than a, a DNS uh, lookup uh, because the DNS services are often disabled. It shows all the HTTP and, and, and ping and trace route uh, behavior from, from there. After that, it then shows us all the registry keys which have been read. If we go down a little bit further. Okay, so this shows each registry key that's been read. So on, in a lot of applications, they'll go in and read lots of keys, but this is the software finding out things about the machine, where the home folders are, and, and so on. So we have a list of, of all the, the registry keys that, that are read, and then we should be able to see the registry keys which have been updated, hopefully, from there. Okay, so in here, we actually see uh, the keys that the ransomware has updated on there. I think one of them is uh, speech. <laughs> voices uh, so it goes in and changes I think the the voice to be uh, a, a Microsoft voice a agent uh, on on the machine and we can also see <coughs> the other things that, that it's actually modified okay so that that gives us uh, our, our basic trace for our evidence and the good thing with Cuckoo is that it will give us the Wireshark trace for uh, the investigation. Okay, so this, this is taken live uh, from, from the system. This part here uh, you is, and you can see it's using uh, a secure connection to the command and control. And then you'll see lots of this traffic here. So the the latest malware will use UDP and it will go and try lots of addresses on, on a certain network. If you actually look inside, it's difficult to see what it actually is, uh, but this is a, in some way sending back uh, the, uh, the key back to the, uh, to the source of the, of the malware. Okay, so it's through this evidence dump that we can actually learn about how uh, the malware actually works. And hopefully you have a chance in the lab to look at your own ransomware. Okay, so that's server. <coughs> and you'll see server now uses UDP uh, and it's, it's streaming uh, the data into, into set networks. And now you get payload builders uh, that will do it all for you. It defines the extensions. If you want to target, the, if the malware writer wants to target a certain file on a certain system, that will be created uh, such, as, uh, such as that. Okay, so that's, our, that's the way we would typically investigate it. There's Cuckoo. Here we link it to a hard disk and we make sure that, that everything is, is, is secure. Uh, for evasion methods, uh, they'll typically uh, be trying to run processes which will, which will uh, not uh, be identified uh, with, with the malware. Uh, they're using HTTP, yes, and Tor and uh, core encryption to be able to avoid any detection from the, from, from the virus scanner. Uh, they will try to find out if there's a debugger. So we'll come back on to that in the next part. But the, there's a constant chase between debuggers and malware writers as to trying to crash the debugger. So they will also obfuscate the code and encrypt all the strings. Uh, they'll use packers in terms of repackaging the malware, so it's almost impossible for a, a virus scanner to actually uh, detect that the, the malware is, is, is there. <coughs> As I said, the methods that they use, uh, this was the, the original one, ECB, 
they're now using CBC and in quite a few cases they're now doing a handshake over the internet using an elliptic curve uh, diffie Hellman in the same way that HTTP would actually uh, do it. Uh, this is the one that we analysed here. Uh, this is a real uh, malware and you can actually see that uh, the same files, when the files were selected and encrypted, uh, you can see a, a different, different file names here. Okay, so this is in a, these are different files, sorry, these are files in a different place and you can actually see the, crypt, the crypto is the same. So that identifies that we're using ECB here because what should happen is that every time we encrypt a file we'll see a different uh, cipher stream because of the salt and the initialization vector and this shows you how, how weak some of the early uh, ransomware actually was. Okay, so they, they tried to disable that as quickly as they can, so make sure that's, that's enabled. So how to avoid, <coughs> this is Trend Micro's advice, don't click on links. <laughs> it seems crazy, but uh, you wouldn't believe the number of people. So many companies now have pen testing of the people in the company where they'll send out fake phishing emails and if somebody clicks on the link they are then contacted and they will go on a training course about how not to click on links that come into the into the company. You should always keep backups, always keep backups, at least three copies and at least one off-site. Uh, just in case you have some sort of problem in your own site, the other one should be off-site. You should have a layered approach to your security, uh, different layers, different ways of, of creating an onion defence around your, your network. Segment your network, make sure that, that, that parts of the network can be contactable by other parts. And then to have a whitelisting program rather than a, a blacklisting uh, approach. So more and more systems have been built that actually define the whitelist of all the, the machines that are allowed to contact uh, with inside that infrastructure and it moves away from the blacklisting type uh, approach. Okay, so that, that was a, a brief introduction to ransomware. So hopefully in the lab today you'll have an opportunity to have a look at, a, at an evidence bag. And uh, what we'll do after the break is we'll look at some of the methods that we can use to be able to protect uh, uh, programs from, from being cracked. Does anybody have any questions on what we've done? Uh, I'll make sure the slides are available and I'll do a voiceover for it too. Any questions? Has anybody in, been infected by ransomware, go on, admit it. Or do you know anybody that has been infected? Company, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't say the company, but uh, yeah, a small company. Uh, I suppose a relatively small, it's just a wind power. Wind. Yeah, energy companies are, are, are another target for them because obviously, uh, I mean, it's a target for things like cyber warfare. When you think about it, if it's a nation state against another nation state, then uh, uh, to, to install malware such as ransomware in an energy network can cause large scale damage if it can shut down uh, equipment. Anybody else? Yeah? Yeah, there's an insurance uh, claims agent uh -huh. who was uh, infected with the crypto locker. And uh, I ended up just advising him to pay. Just to pay, yeah. So, uh, the, yeah. Yeah. So, but a few yeah. Yeah. so, so quite a few of the crime gangs have been caught and the, the private keys have been released. So there's quite a few of them that it's known and there are many, many tools around uh, that, can, that can actually decrypt the encrypted content. So that's the only thing to try, is to try some, some tools to, to see if they work, but then it's probably just appear. Anybody else? No? Good. Right, well this is, this is the last thing that, that we're going to do. So as I said, the, there's one question in the test. Uh, next week, part of it will be on ransomware and the other part will be around this, this part. So uh, the, 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 the problem that, that, that you have is that most, most security vulnerabilities are caused by, by, by software. And 
And what we need to do is to be able to uh, protect our software from people cracking uh, the, the, the executables. So the flaws that, that we have, and I appreciate you've probably covered this in another module, is that uh, you've typically got trapdoors, a trapdoor in, in a piece of software, or you've got other types of things that will cause the software not to work as, 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 it, as it should. Uh, so a typical system is where we've got serialization of, of data, where somebody can compromise the data that's plastic in between the processes that, 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 uh, that get the data. So some of the best practices in terms of uh, defining uh, software, and a lot of companies are moving towards this, is the principle of least privilege. So many systems now are defined where you get the lowest level of privilege possible, and if you want to do anything additional, you need to escalate your privilege up, uh, and you can only hold on to that privilege for a certain amount of time before it, you're, you're actually knocked, knocked back down. You should never trust external systems. Uh, you should never rely on obfuscation of your code uh, to stop it from, from being uh, stolen. If it's not used, disable it. So it's a very simple process, but if you're running a server, then uh, you don't have ports open if they don't actually have to be open. Uh, so there's the, and also the system is only secure as the, as the weakest link actually in, in, the, in the system. So some of the problems that we've had in the past uh, have been things like DLL hell. So DLL hell was when uh, a certain application was bound to a certain DLL. Uh, a new DLL came along and replaced that existing one and then your program couldn't run and it would crash and, and, and so on. So the way that Windows handled its DLLs was actually very, very poor. It just had the general space that you could go to to be able to bind uh, these things. Applications too ran directly on the hardware and they could hog it and cause blue screens uh, and, and, and so on. Someone could replace DLLs and drivers on the system and it would cause that to be, to be compromised. Uh, so there was a whole lot of problems that, uh, that have happened in the past. But our software is generally moving away from what you would call a thick client towards thin clients. So thin clients are more to do with, uh, with your, your code running within a framework or within a sandbox. So in Java and .NET, we run it with inside the .NET framework or the Java uh, runtime environment and the code should be isolated from uh, the other applications and from the system. But increasingly, this is the way that we have our architecture of most of our systems now, is to run a web infrastructure where most of the software is run from, from the web uh, infrastructure and we use a lightweight client to be able to contact it. So how can we keep our code secure? How can we stop uh, hackers from reverse engineering a code. A C++ program that's compiled to an exe, can that be cracked? Can you get the original C++ codes from it, do you think? Um, well, it's, it's true, you can. It's not so easy, but with things like Java and, and, and .NET, it's actually very simple because they compile into an intermediate language and then it's easy to reverse that back into the original source code. So there's an example of a .NET uh, program here. It's a very simple one. And what it's compiled into isn't machine code, isn't a runtime, but an intermediate code. So this is what the intermediate code looks like. And this can then run on any machine that, that, that you want. And you can see here that every one of your strings and every one of your variable names are still contained in the actual intermediate code. So if somebody gets your exe, it takes them less than a second to reverse the whole of the code back into a C-sharp program. So we see many examples of this where people have lost their source code and you just say, well, give us your exe 
and then use a, a, a reverse engineering package and out comes all of the program uh, uh, again. And this causes a problem because it's easy to, to reverse a, a Java or a, or a C Sharp uh, program. So on, on the online video, I give a, a demonstration of this and hopefully we'll do it in the lab. So there's a little simple program. Uh, I compile it into an executable. And you can see here, there is my little executable uh, in there. I then run it and it's just a little simple program to, to calculate a square root of a, of a number. So that runs uh, OK. I then take a program called Exemplar. So Exemplar is, an, is, an, is a free reverse engineering package for .NET. I run it against the EXE and I output list.cs. OK, so I now have a file called list.cs and there you go. So without any uh, any requirement uh, to look at the source code, I can reverse engineer the exe back into the, the, the C sharp uh, code. Same goes for Java, same goes for Android, an Android device, then it's still intermediate code and, and, and you can reverse it back. What is the, what is the thing that you run with, uh, with uh, Android? What's the, so it's not an exe, what would you run on an Android device? Yeah, so an APK and we're running jar type files. So the jar is the compiled version of the code. And so the same goes with this. We take our jar file and we can reverse back the original Java file uh, from here. No security involved uh, in, in there. So if your company is producing Java code or C Sharp code, you've really got to worry that you're distributing code that somebody can easily uh, reverse engineer and flip a, a, a switch. So what you really want to do is to make sure it's really difficult for them. You're not going to stop them from ever reverse engineering the code. They'll stick it on a debugger and they'll find exactly how your code actually works. So what you need to do is to throw rocks in their, in their path. Okay, so this is, a, this is .NET Reflector. So .NET Reflector allows you to, to view your, uh, your exe, your, your it's an MSIL, it's the Microsoft Intermediate Language EXE. So we're looking at the EXE here, we've loaded it up, and we can see here that this is able to reconstruct the original code again, purely from what we would normally define as a binary type, type file. Uh, and there's packages such as this, this is a decompiler for, uh, for .NET and for Java. It will typically cost you at least a thousand dollars for a time-limited license for one seat with this type of, 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 of package. So they're, they're expensive, but they're, they're well worth well. In this case, they're, they're worth it if you need to reverse the original source code. So let's look at obfuscation and how obfuscation actually works and how we can make sure that our code is protected. So this is a C program, can anybody see what that actually says or does? No. Oh. Given time, you could. Yeah, that's right. So, so this program does run, but it breaches all of the nice things that we've been told to do when we write programs to make it uh, uh, sort of English. And we've seen it with our, ja our JavaScript, the, the malware, uh, before. What it does print is this. Okay, so they've used every trick in the book here, but it, uh, it, it tells you the, the 12 days of, of Christmas when, when it's actually run. And what they've really done is they've got rid of white space, because we love white space, uh, in new lines and so on. And tabs, don't we love tabs? We can't do without tabs, especially with Python, where we can do without tabs. That's for definite. Uh, they've used conditional uh, and list expressions in, in terms of uh, if then else's uh, and statement blocks. They've used encoding, oct octal, and hex, and, and all the different ways to, to do it. And they've encoded. Uh, 
a multiple functions. Now we typically have little, lots of nice little functions. They've overloaded them all into a single, single function. So they've generally tried to mangle uh, the code as much as possible to make it uh, sort of non-human human ready. Uh, so what happened to me, so I had a program called Network Sims and I had an EXE and uh, I, what you've got to watch is that, is that all, your, all your variables will actually come out uh, in, in the name. So this is, this is my source code. For, I had a little network simulator for, for, for uh, Cisco devices uh, and the code that came out was an AXE and it came out with all the variable names. So what we can do is to run, uh, run, uh, we we can we can we can use an obfuscator to be able to change the names of each of the variables to a non-printable version. So the the code on the right hand side has been through an obfuscator, and what we've done is done a variable rename. And what I've done to make it even more difficult for somebody to reverse it is I've made it non-printable. <laughs> so that makes it really difficult because even the things like the smiley faces and so on are actually a valid character for a, a variable name. So this is one way. Uh, this isn't stopping anybody from reversing our code, but it's going to be really difficult for them to maintain it because they're going to have to search for smiley face 59 and so on when they're looking for, for variables. So it's unlikely they're going to be able to, uh, to modify the code. The other thing that we do with obfuscation is that we encrypt uh, the strings with inside the text. If you look at any C++ program, then you'll actually see the plain text strings that you're using. And it's a standard way that a malware uh, uh, scanner would actually look with inside the EXE and see plain text strings. With uh, string encryption, all of our strings are encrypted in some sort of way with, with some sort of key. Again, it doesn't stop the program from running, uh, but it at least stops it from, from being uh, uh, cracked. They also the flow of obfuscation, where they'll change the nice flow and they'll break it up into different elements. So if there's one do-while loop, they might split it up into 10 do-while loops and still do the same uh, type, type of thing. Okay, so I've got a little demo online if you want to have a look at it, but uh, I've got an example of using the obfuscator to be able to obfuscate uh, the, the, the code. Okay, so there, here's, here's an example here. So we take our, our code, that becomes the, the intermediate language there. We then put it through our obfuscator, and you can see the names of the variables have been changed. So we'll see v0 and v1 and, and, and so on. And this makes it difficult for the, for the cracker to be able to maintain the code because all the nice names that you've actually defined in your code have now been replaced with generic type variable names. What we can also do is that we can rename the classes uh, in this case, we've got a class 1 here, and we can see it's just been renamed as, as A. So it become virtually impossible for somebody to take the code and then maintain it, because all the variables and the classes have actually changed uh, their, their, their names. And then what the obfuscator tries to do is it tries to crash any sort of debugger uh, that, that's running. So in this case, when we run exemplar, if the obfuscator is running correctly, then it should crash uh, the debugger when, when we actually run it. Okay, so that's just a quick outline on some of the methods. So I've got a little uh, demo on the online version of the, the lecture to give you a kind of heads up on, on how it's actually used. Hopefully in the lab today, we'll be able to create some EXEs and then we'll be able to reverse them back for both uh, Java and C Sharp. Okay, does anybody have any questions on what we've done today?